on nearly every area of tech <laughs> you can kind of think of. And most importantly, when I'm predicting the future, I have short hair glasses and a goatee, so I can kind of stroke my goatee and think big thoughts about what's coming next. Very important. All right. So before we jump ahead and say what's coming next with software, I want to set the stage with where are we, where we've we been with hardware and software, and then that helps kind of establish some trend lines and some exponential curves that we use to project forward. So on the hardware side, I think this is really convenient. I get to compare Apollo 11 versus iPhone 11 because it was just a few weeks ago, 51 years ago, that uh, Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. And if you compare processing power, the current phone you might have in your pocket was 100,000 times faster. So think about potentially handling 100,000 concurrent moon landings with your phone. It's kind of insane. And we have a million times more memory in the phone. Now, if your use case is different, you're trying to squish something, the moon lander is a lot heavier. So that's, a, that's great for that use case. Not much good for anything else processing wise, right? And the reason why I do this comparison, and a lot of people think, well, yeah, 50 years, um, but that's not what's gonna happen next. That's just what happened in the past because that was the dawn of computing when computers were, were people with pencils and slide rules. This is a one-off. Right, it's not gonna happen again. Well, I think I'm going to try to argue the case that not only are these kind of exponentials gonna happen again, they're speeding up. We're gonna see even more change 50 years from now. It's gonna be very hard to recognize what we have today. It's, it's gonna feel like stone ages. You remember the Bill Gates quote, nobody needs more than 640K? And my laptop's got 100,000 times that much RAM. So things changing faster than we think and accelerating. Another example of that, NVIDIA's got a card, right, the Pegasus, which they say is fast enough to handle full autonomous driving, level five, meaning any conditions under which a human can drive a car, this thing will have enough processing power to handle. And to give you just a flavor of the tech, we're talking about over 300 trillion operations a second, terabyte of memory access per second, 500 watts. Put that in context, the fastest supercomputer in the world by IBM 15 years ago was slower the size of a house and took three quarters of a million watts of power. That's a lot of progress in just 15 years. And the new version of the NVIDIA card is six times faster. And to put that in context, the new world's fastest supercomputer just announced a few weeks ago out of Japan is only 200 times faster than that. So we're catching up. The things you can afford to buy as a, as a consumer and put in cards are getting closer and closer to the state of the art over time. And the state of art is still massive, multi-million dollar, multi-year type build outs. You can drop these cards in a chassis at home if you want, right? So it's accelerating, we're getting faster. Now, good news is the wetware we have is still pretty decent in comparison. A lot of memory, pretty good parallel processing, very low power, less than a light bulb. Uh, but the hardware guys aren't standing still. You know, there's now brain chips, 5BM and others are doing this. They're actually mixing physical biological neurons on chips and directly couple, coupling them with silicone and digital technology. So you can get kind of the best of both worlds and now able to run AI algorithms faster than ever. And that's just the beginning. We'll talk more about this. Okay, let's put, set some context for software. We've probably all seen and gotten sick of this quote from Mark Andreessen, software is eating the world nine years ago now. What did he mean by that? Well, it means data, bits, software, app companies are disrupting traditional markets. You used to go to Barnes & Noble to get a book. Now, not only do you get books from Amazon, you get almost everything else. They're doing over 30% of all the world's e-commerce online. Massive disruption of bricks and mortar stores. Apple did something like this for music. You used to go to the mall, remember that CD store? <laughs> now you download bits, you got an app. Netflix, you went to Blockbuster, remember that? I just saw yesterday in the news, the last Blockbuster store. It's still, uh, I, I don't know how it's surviving, but bits, data, downloads, massive disruption. Tesla, you've heard of them. They make a really cool 17 inch tablet. You can surf the web and do other stuff, but it's kind of big and heavy. So they put a car around it so you can take it with you wherever you go. It's very nice of them, right? Another software company, over the air updates. Um, Another example of their software, and you, whether you believe Elon Musk's predictions or not, he's saying by the end of this year, we're gonna have full level five autonomous driving. And yeah, may, he might be off by two years, he sometimes is, but even if that's the case, a massive 
global game changer. And now they're the most valuable automaker in the world by market cap. So they got more resources to make that happen. Speaking of apps, these guys, whether you like them or not, at one point, Uber was valued at over $50 billion when all they had was bits. They had an app. They didn't own any vehicles and yet they totally disrupted the transportation industry. You can hit a button, have a complete stranger come and do your bidding. And it's like living the life of a billionaire from 30 years ago. Right. And it's not just these, what are called the FANG companies, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. It's everybody. Analysts are saying every global 2000 company is a software company. We've heard this time and time again with Perforce customers. People saying, hey, we're a software company in the financial space. We're a software company in the healthcare space or the automotive space. Everybody's going into software, bits, data, digitization, right? And because of that, development time, team sizes are doubling. Anybody pursuing digital transformation, digital ecosystems, digital marketplaces, wherever you want to call it, they're reinventing themselves to jump on this bandwagon. They don't want to be left behind. Teams are getting bigger. They're becoming true software companies, everybody, every space, which is why some of the analysts are saying that recruiting and retaining developer talent is going to hit the CEO's top five list for success. That's massive, right? Software everywhere. And again, not just those tech companies. The last time you had a can of chicken noodle soup, you're thinking this is the last thing from a tech company. These guys have a tech fund. They invest in a startup uh, focused on nutrition tech recently, DNA specific nutrition and food. So you can go get a, eventually get a can of chicken noodle soup that's designed exactly for your and only your body to maximize nutrition. Everybody's in tech. And if you compare some of the old school stuff on the right with the new stuff on the left, the stuff on the right, the blockbusters and the bookstores, the DIY clouds and stuff like data centers, stuff like that, tended to be heavier weight, bigger commitment, all or none, harder to get out of once you jump in. Stuff on the left, easy in, easy out. I can sign up for Netflix for one month, watch everything I want, turn it off. I can take one ride with Uber, never sign up, never commit to anything. Amazon, so it's not just consumers. I can rent computing by the hour. People would have thought that was crazy when it came out. Last year, they were a $35 billion business just for AWS, right? It's all about maximizing my flexibility and minimizing my cost of change. And I think that's the message going forward. I'm gonna repeat that in a number of contexts. So if you look back 15 years ago, what was our life like day to day? Before the advent of cloud, public cloud, Netflix, right? Uber, Facebook, Twitter, smartphones. What did, you, what did you do? What was your life like and how is it different now? Every day, nearly everybody's life has changed. And yet this next 10 years that we're in the middle of is seeing 10x more change than that. That's a massive amount of change. Now I'm going to do at ArchConf in December, I'm going to do the long version of this talk. This is a, the, the short version I'm doing today, right? Where I'm going to talk about lots more stuff. 3D printing, gene editing, biohacking, nanotech, generative interfaces, space travel, cryogenetics, virtual reality, augmented reality, 5G, robotics, power tech, all kinds of stuff that kind of shows this 10x is not only happening, it could easily be more than 10x change in our lives. It's massive. And we're right in the middle of it. Some example of that in the, in the software front, some of these might look familiar to you on the right. The, the kind of uh, last gen, I would say, sort of tech the new gen stuff on the left, again, stuff on the left, easier in, easier out, incrementally adoptable, legacy friendly in a lot of cases, more declarative. I don't have to deal with all the details so much. Stuff on the right, a little heavier weight, heavier to get in, more commitment to get the value out, right? All those kind of things, overhead. Microservices, we'll talk about that. It's an interesting one that kind of fits somewhere in there. A lot of what's driving this change, we're gonna double the number of users on the internet in the next few years, right, by, by uh, um, some of the predictions like from Singularity Hub. And part of what's driving that is ubiquitous global satellite, satellite internet coverage. If you're up to speed with Elon Musk company Starlink, over 500 satellites in orbit now, launching over 100 new ones a month. The initial plan is to have 12,000 satellites and then eventually 42,000 satellites for 5G type speeds, low Earth orbit, Fast internet anywhere on the planet, Antarctica, desert, top of a mountain, doesn't matter. Jeff Bezos of Amazon just pledged $10 billion to compete with them and do the same thing. There are other competitors already launching satellites in the space, right? 
massive game changer. You could live anywhere. You could be on this Zoom call watching me right now from the top of a mountain and have just as fast connection. And all those people, those new 4 billion people are going to want to consume and produce and innovate. And they can do that by creating startups like anybody else can. But now it costs, when I founded Open Logic, you know, in the, in the 2000 era, cost a lot more. You had to have data centers. You had to buy a lot of hardware, a lot of expensive software licenses. Now you've got open source, cloud, everything is a service, right? A lot cheaper. And if $5,000 is still a lot of money, more crowdfunding available than ever, right? 10x and growing. Lots of uh, micro lending and other ways to get funding for new ideas. And you can launch something in a weekend and be at internet scale based on the cloud and open source with almost no overhead. And then hopefully you've got a model to pay for the bill that comes in later, but you can scale to the entire planet that quickly. And because of all these innovations, what IDC is calling multiplied innovation, these business models are driving a 10x increase in apps and services, and over half of the global economy will be digitized by next year. That's insane. You think about all the cars and books and cans of soup out there, those physical goods will be less than half of the digital global economy, all moving to bits, data, and software. It took us as a species about 40 years to write a half a billion apps. Guess how long it'll take to write the next half billion? Three more years. That is some crazy pace, 100 million new apps a year. There's only 20 million developers in the world by some counts. That's a lot of apps. And part of the reason we're gonna get there so fast is that you know, analysts are saying there's no more traditional applications, the fat word, right? The big packaged SATP type apps, it's gonna be applications, it's gonna be more like the bite size apps. You know, I wanna request time off of work, I wanna hit two buttons on my phone, use an app that's tailored just for that that has a great fast user experience. I'm in, I'm out, I'm done. My manager gets it up, a notification, hits a button to improve, they're done. You're in, you're out, great user experience. Those I think are the kinds of these hundreds of millions of apps we're writing that are going to be cloud-based, microservice, container, all the good hot buzzwords, right, that we see on the left. Lots of boxes and arrows, lots of complication, a lot of moving parts. You know, people think it's going to look like this. In reality, it looks a lot more like this a lot of the time. It's hard to get this right. Cultural changes, process changes, organizational changes, lack of executive sponsorship, you know, unfamiliarity with the new technology. It's going to be tough. In fact, so tough that you know, Gardner says more than 90% of the organizations that try microservices basically are gonna say this, this is too hard. It's too disruptive, they're gonna fall back to many services. As Michael mentioned earlier, I've gotta to talk to compares to micro and mini and macro and other services, but suffice it to say, not everybody's gonna be able to jump on that bandwagon. They're gonna blame the technology instead of their own uh, sort of organizational incompetence in a lot of cases. All right, so anyway, that's a level set. Now let's look forward. All right, where are we from here? First, we'll look at hardware quickly and then we'll turn to software. On the hardware side, I think you're gonna think less about chips and megahertz, right, in the future. It's just gonna be ubiquitous. It's going to just be there. Hardware will be behind the scenes in a lot of cases. Like this is a you know, Waymo self-driving car from uh, Alphabet, the parent of Google. All right, lots of chips, hundreds of millions of lines of code in these things. Mass, you know, I mentioned the Starlink satellites earlier. They've got 70 Linux-based computers, right, in every satellite. That's a massive amount of compute power and software, but it's just behind the scenes. You don't think of it as much. And by the way, we might not be driving on the ground so much as flying. I know everybody's been talking about this for 70 years now, but now we're starting to get bigger players more involved. Audi, Porsche, Hyundai, uh, Toyota just made a $400 million investment in a flying car company based in California all electric and autonomous. We're gonna see a lot more of this coming uh, real soon. So remember the uh, fast satellite internet everywhere? You can live on top of the mountain. Well, now you can hit a button and have the flying Uber come get you, fly you into town, do your business, fly back at the end of the day. You can live virtually anywhere. Pretty cool uh, prospects. One bit of hardware I think is worth calling out. This is an actual quantum computer from IBM. Total game changer, I think it's hard to even predict how much of a game changer it's gonna be, but I will make some guesses. Quantum computers use qubits. You know, we're, we're used to talking about things like 32-bit, 64-bit computing. Now we're talking about qubits. And the, the 
kind of takeaway from this slide is once you have a quantum computer with enough qubits in it, up in that 100 plus range, you can't build a traditional classical computer that can do the same things at any size. And we already have working quantum computers in the 50 to 70 qubit range today and growing fast. I like the fact that you need new programming languages to deal with this. There's a, there's a handful of them out there already kind of gaining momentum. But I like the fact they have stuff like teleport as operation names. That's pretty cool. Right. You can imagine, I can already imagine right now, at some point, some developer is going to write some code. They're going to say, this is good. Give it to QA. QA is going to say, yeah, it failed. It's going to go back to developer. And developer is going to say, well, it worked in my universe. Right? <laughs> it's going to bring a whole new level of complexity for testing when you're dealing with spooky action at a distance in your code. Companies like Volkswagen trying to harness quantum computing for things like full city automated traffic management, where you're controlling every autonomous car, bus, train, watching every pedestrian and trying to maximize throughput of the entire city. It's also DNA specific medicine, quantum AI, tons of research already being done. In fact, you can go right now to a public cloud uh, and rent time on a quantum computer. You can run your first quantum programs with uh, IBM and others. So it's coming. And like I said, we don't know exactly what it can do and exactly when, but some of the predictions are that in 10 years from now, it will be a quote, revolutionary technology. And to give you a flavor of what that means, Gardner's only said that about three other, other things ever. And that's the industrial revolution, World War II and the internet. So true life-changing global game changers uh, coming soon. So we're gonna definitely keep an eye on that one. Lots changing there fast. Okay, that's enough about hardware. So now let's look forward and think about what's coming next for software. How does this affect software developers? Well, first of all, I think speed uh, is becoming less and less optional. You know, Google set the bar at virtually instantaneous. You know, when's the last time you did a Google search and, and didn't get an answer back in two seconds? What did you do? Well, my Wi-Fi is bad, obviously, or I need to close the tab. I need to reboot the browser. I need to check my router. I need to check, reboot my machine. It's definitely not Google, right? That's the dial tone of the internet. Instantaneous is the expectation. I think that's coming to all software. People are going to have more and more choices than ever, thanks to the 4 billion new people coming online and innovating. And you can't be slow. You know, there's a, a, a quote I love from my uh, software engineering master program, which is, if your code is fast and buggy, people will curse you every day. If it's slow, they won't use it. People will become addicted to speed. They're not going to give it up. So what's next with speed? I think what's next is faster than instantaneous. And I will tell you what that means in a few slides. Security, only one thing to say here, which is get it right. Nobody cares what you're doing with security until you screw it up and then they leave. They go find somebody else. This is table stakes. Uh, don't lose my data. Don't corrupt the data. It's not acceptable. All right, here's an example of what the future might look like. You could say, well, it looks exactly the same as now, possibly. I think what you don't see is even more ubiquitous devices. The Alexas, the um, Google Home, right, Siri, but the next version, the smart version, the one that's more context aware, following the conversation, able to be proactive. I think, yeah, we're going to still have all the same devices, the, the phones and tablets and laptops and things. There are also going to be a lot more effectors, things where you can change your environment by talking, using gestures, having it react to you, being proactive, etc. And we'll talk, give me an example of that coming up. Dad obviously can't even figure out the clicker, so he's, he's pretty much out of luck. Uh, I think mom's probably got it right. Let the tech come to her, right? Let it, let it do what she needs as opposed to her warping her life to work with it. Here's an example of what shopping might look like going forward. Okay, no, not this. Clippy must die and stay dead. Maybe more like this, computer. No, I think this is still too reactive. I think we're going to see something more proactive. I think it might look like this. This is a blow up of my iPhone. And I'm going to say Sparky because I named my uh, PDA, personal digital assistant, Sparky. I'm going to say, Sparky, I need some new shoes. He's going to say, what do you think of these? Now, why did I get those? Because Spike, Sparky's fully aware of my context, knows my calendar, knows 
where I am with GPS. I'm hiking, I'm from Colorado, I'm in the mountains, I'm hiking. I've been complaining about my foot hurting for 15 minutes. He knows the context, knows I need hiking boots, knows what I've spent in the past, can read social media to know what the trends are for styles and fashion, has read all the reviews from Amazon and footwear sites and proactively suggested these. I didn't have to do a manual search. I didn't run an app. I just said, here's what's going on. All right, so I'm gonna say those, those brown ones look interesting, show me those. And I'm gonna to get to see myself modeling those to me pre-broken in in real time based on AI, right? So again, my context, my needs, a whole lot less me focusing on somebody's software and more getting presented and letting me steer the conversation away from what I don't like and towards what I like. Let me say those look good, I'll take those. Sparky says, good choice, sir, confirmed to arrive in time for next week's hike because again, knows my calendar, knows where I'm going, knows what I'm gonna need and will expedite shipping accordingly. Also went ahead and ordered some coordinating socks, has done the research, figured out what I might need. I can cancel this if I don't like it, but I'm gonna be presenting, presented with automatic action based on me and my needs and my history. And I put the 225 bucks on your Apple account so you can take another ice stuff, get more ice stuff points for an eye vacation because he knows I'm an Apple fanboy, right? And automatically takes care of my needs. So I think this is what it's gonna look like to be a software developer in the future. You know, whoever owns the device, and this is gonna be uh, the operating system supplier, the hardware vendor, they're gonna own the primary AI on a device. They're gonna own the conversation and the context. They will call out to other APIs, other tools as necessary to seamlessly assemble this user experience for me, negotiate prices in the background. I commit the transaction, the, the APIs and their makers get the cut and I move on. As a user, I get to achieve my goal quickly and get on with my life. I don't wanna use your stuff, I wanna solve my problem. I'm, I, I'm not interested in learning apps installing, upgrading, right? I just want my problem solved as quickly and easily as possible. Whoever gives that to me is gonna get the business. This is all powered by AI, right? We said software is eating the world, AI is gonna eat software. Same kind of disruption is coming. You've gotta have the AI, there's an accelerating pace of change. You know, machines, robots, AI is doing the dirty, dangerous jobs people don't wanna do, do, do. And it will eventually increase overall prosperity um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Because of that, the analysts are saying immediately go hire CS grads with AI especially. There's not enough to go around. They're making a fortune right out of school with all companies in the world becoming software companies, not enough developers, definitely not enough AI. We are seeing some AI already in development space. You know, there's lots of bots. There's GitHub actions. There's you know, Slack bots. It, kind of nibbling at it way the fringes, you may not think, well, that's not it. real AI. It's machine learning, but the point is they're starting to make inroads to do things like the basics, build, deploy. I'll talk about production data in just a minute. Enforcing standards and code reviews and doing some basic visual testing, mocking data, you know, things like uh, open source storybook, integrated with code reviews, deployments, CI check-ins, et cetera, coming to developers where they live, not the other way around, right? They're making it so you can stay in your your GitHub, your GitHub, your Slack, your IDE of choice, and not have to go out to use other tools. More integrated. I think the results are better consistency, better quality. You're getting junior developers being mentored essentially by AIs. GitHub already has some of that today. They can help you choose open source to contribute to, find a bug to fix, help you commit it, the whole thing, get you up to speed faster, let you stay where you like to live, and you know, we know where like herding cats developers are for management, right? So anything that can help make it easier for everybody is a good thing. I mentioned production data being involved. This is, I don't know if uh, you're familiar with GraphQL, but this is an example of a GraphQL query language and it's just a plugin for VS Code I'm showing here. The key here is that as a developer is writing a query in the IDE, right? So they haven't even, haven't even done a, a build yet, they're getting from the AI inserted in comments, right? The code, hey, you know, when you eventually get this home into production, at the 95th percentile, this will increase the, the time of this query by 44 milliseconds. That's amazing feedback to get that could sometimes take days, weeks, months to get into developers' hands and brain. Now you get it as you're typing the code. 
pretty awesome. I think we're going to see more code reviews, automatic code reviews, static code analysis, performance estimates, security, you know, what you just typed open a security vulnerability, you know, backspace, backspace, don't want to do that. I think we're going to see more and more of that right up front in the development process. Lots more things AIs can do. Lip reading better than the best humans in the world. Starting to mix lip reading with voice recognition to get 100% accuracy. That'll be welcome. AI is outplaying the best Texas No Limit Hold'em poker players in the world. It's not even close. AI is generating things, music, images, videos. All these people are fake based off of actual pictures of humans. These are fake humans that look real, right? So good at this counterfeit reality, in fact, that right now only AIs can tell the difference. And by the end of this year, predictions are that the AIs won't even be able to tell the difference because the fakes will be too good, which will be interesting for the US election coming up, I think, when you can just type whatever you want someone to say in a text field and you get a realistic video of them doing it. It's gonna be interesting. Uh, if you haven't kept up with things like game playing, AlphaGo, you know, the, the game is orders of magnitude more complex than chess. Uh, just five years ago, when the top AI experts in the world were asked, how long will it take for AIs to beat the best human player in the world? The average was over 100 years from now. It's already been done. So good, in fact, that the top player in the world has basically given up the game. It's not interesting anymore. They did this by training it on millions of human games. The next version, they said, well, let's just teach it the rules of the game only and let it play itself. Turns out this one's better. It didn't pick up any bad habits from the best humans in the world. And they said, if that worked, Let's teach it rules of other games. They did, they trained for nine hours on the Google cluster and now it's the best chess player and best shogi Japanese chess player in the world. So just by teaching it rules. In the next version of this, they said, you know what? Let's not even teach it the rules of the game. Let's let it just watch games and uh, figure out the rules like a kid would be if they just walked up and watched somebody playing chess. And the only thing they'll tell it now is whether it makes an illegal move or not, that's it. And that algorithm is just as good as the others. Give you a few seconds to read through this and see what you think. Might make you feel a little bit better for a second until you realize that it was written by an AI. This is an example of GPT-3. It's kind of making a lot of news right now, doing some pretty amazing stuff where you can just say it was a dark and stormy night and uh, hit go and it'll complete that and give you a, you know, a 500 word essay, a book, say rewrite this book in the style of this other author, even say explain what these Linux command line flags do in plain English or let you say in plain English what you want to do and it will generate the command line arguments. Kind of an amazing amount of stuff this algorithm is doing and this is still the very early days. You know, deep mind the wing of uh, Google focused on AI as a motto to solve intelligence and make it the world a better place. We just don't know if they mean for the AIs or for the humans. I guess we'll find out. So build your bunker now. Good news is there's a lot of AI and open source. Over 9,000 open source packages focused on AI, including some big ones that are well-funded. You know, OpenAI, the one I just mentioned that created the GPT-3 algorithm. Over a billion dollars invested by Elon Musk and another billion by Microsoft. Right, so some of the most state-of-the-art open uh, AI in the world is open source, so no real excuse not to use this in your own stuff. Now, in order to run it, to train AIs to recognize, you know, pictures of cats and everything else, cost about a thousand dollars three years ago. Last year, ten bucks. And if you wanted to recognize your picture of Fluffy and say that's yeah, a cat, and you want to do that a billion times, three years ago is ten grand. Last year, three cents six to seven orders of magnitude improvement in two years, mainly in terms of custom specific hardware built to run AI algorithms and train neural nets and, and run inference engines. So getting cheap, open source, you can use it anywhere. And that's part of why PricewaterhouseCoopers says in 10 years, the contribution to the global economy is $15 trillion. That's net, that's an increase over and above anything disrupted by AI itself. So it's gonna lift everybody up massively. Now getting there is going to be bumpy though. A lot of jobs lost. This is US centric, but a lot of jobs lost before they're gained. A lot of people are going to have to be retrained and learn new things because AI is getting very powerful very quickly, not a lot of time to adapt. 
might be making this face. A lot of people do when they see some of this. Right? Don't panic just yet because you know, even though the godfather of AI said that in from three to eight years we'll have the machine, have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. He said it in 1970. So he's about as good at estimating as most engineers with story points, right? We might have a little more time than we think. And we're also not standing still, right? We are gonna be growing ourselves, Humanity 2.0. We are pretty good at input, about 10 megabits per second through our eyes primarily and also ears. Our output, horrible, 200 bits per second. All we can do is move little meat sticks we call fingers, flex some strings in our throat and vibrate the air and make voice, that's about it. Right. So companies like Control Labs, creating wireless bracelets that detect signals going from your brain to your hand that you can learn to do things like control robotic arms, fly a ship in an asteroids game just by thinking about it. You don't actually have to move your hand. And you can be trained to do lots more stuff with this. There's prototypes. These guys were bought by Facebook last year. There's prototypes where you can have headphones where you can skip to the next track, pause, play, change volume just by thought. Others where you can change the channel on the TV just by thinking about it, your remote controls. And these are already uh, in development today. Thought to text, for example, 97% accurate already. This guy again with the company Neuralink, creating this neural lace thing on the right, that the idea is you would basically insert this in the back of your skull, it unfurls to cover your brain and you have direct thought access to the internet. And it's not the only company doing it. There's at least a dozen, Facebook, Google, IBM, DARPA, projects out of China and Russia. There's tons of research happening here to help us be as fast at input and output as the AIs are so that we have a chance to compete. All right, so how do we get there from here? It sounds like a lot of, a lot of pie in the sky. All right, let's bring it back to ground. What does all this stuff have in common? Well, one thing it has in common is all powered by software. Everything from the, the, you know, the, the flying car to the nutrition tech in the can of soup, all software, all industries, all the time. So awesome time to be in software development. And it used to be, this is a printing press from the 1800s, it used to be that the means of production were kind of in the hands of a few, right? You had to come to the machine, you had to come to the tool to do the work. Now, fast internet everywhere on earth coming in a few years, autonomous vehicles to take you where you wanna go, 9,000 packages for open source, public cloud, it costs you three cents to run AI algorithms. No excuse, everybody has a means of production, including those four billion new people about to join the internet are going to have the same access to all that stuff as everybody else immediately. So I think it's gonna be in the future, we're competing way less on access to resources and more about what can you do with them? Who can create the best user experience to get out of my way Remove friction, don't let me think about your thing, solve my problem in the most easy, fast, painless way imaginable, that's who gets the business. So success becomes a lot more about how do you ask the right questions and how, how do you ask those questions than knowing the answers. Everybody's gonna have the same answers available. So it changes the way we think of things. I think we're also seeing in, in developers and all these companies, a lot of pressure. Those 500 million new apps we're writing with new developers, a lot of openings now, right? Not enough developers when every company in the world is a software company. Writing new tech with AI and progressive web apps and VR and all kinds of other stuff, right? And you're trying to do it 10 times faster than ever to match the change in pace of the market. So new people, new tech, going faster than ever. What could possibly go wrong? Right? I think it's probably more like this picture. There's a lot of things that can go wrong out there. So there's, there's some near-term stuff you can do to kind of go down the right path. You know, GraphQL, great example, grown 700% in the last two years. If you're not familiar with it, definitely worth taking a look. Progressive web apps kind of give you the, the ability to use web tech and be sort of on par with native apps, right? Yeah, all about going faster. 80% of all emerging technologies by next year will have AI foundations. That's every flavor of tech, every industry, everywhere. And people spending more on bots and chatbot creation than, than traditional web apps. Again, more and more AI, more user experience. Final quote I'll leave you with, another one I love. The future has not been written. There's no fate but what we make for ourselves. So good place to be. You're already software development. You're, you're focused on tools. You're educating yourself. 
I'm sure you're using open source. I'm sure you're using cloud, AIs, APIs, things as a service. My kind of takeaway is focus on the user experience. That's what matters most. That's where we're going to compete in the future. And with that, I think maybe there's a few minutes for questions. Let's see if Michael gives me time. <laughs> Let's see. Can you hear me? I can. All right. I'm going to check. Looks like we got a few things coming in um, and from chat. And actually, I'm just going to start here because uh, Scott just dropped this into the chat. And I think this is a great place to start. <laughs> he says, it sounds like privacy will become a quaint Luddite memory. Or am I wrong? Um, I think you're right. It's as scary as that may be. Um, well, I, get, I, I do get asked this a lot, by the way. So I, I think there's some competing um, efforts here. I think by default, you'll have zero privacy for sure. Because you think of all the devices I talk about and the things listening mm -hmm. for context. And those are things we intentionally buy and put in our house, let alone oh, yeah. all the ones in public spaces, cameras, microphones, and all that stuff. So I, I suspect... This is a, uh, obviously just a speculation. I think we're going to use AI, kind of like Iron Man had Jarvis, mm -hmm. to be our personal interface to the world. And that AI is going to be responsible for trying to keep us as anonymous as we would like, to automatically request removal of data, to mm. keep out spam. Um, I think that's going to be a massive new industry of competition for who can build that that sort of AI protector that we rely on for all of our interface, protects us from malware, viruses, everything, financials, right? That's to, to keep us from being pushed down a path by recommendation systems that have a hidden motive trying to make us buy from some company, right? All those things, we're gonna need that personal protector to help with. And I think privacy is a big part of that. Oh, uh, sure. And, and just kind of one more point. Um, it's, it's interesting you say that because that is exactly the kind of problem that, uh, that something uh, some some soon to be developed AI could solve. Uh, it was interesting. I was listening to a podcast uh, about a year or so ago called Reply All, and they had an episode entitled The Snapchat Thief. And it was they were they were called upon by a listener to solve one of their thornier tech problems. And the tech problem was, in fact, this individual's Snapchat account was uh, hijacked and stolen and was unrecoverable by conventional means. And so they, they, they went down this rabbit hole of, of how the account was hijacked and, and, and how vulnerable we all really are, even if we're using two-factor authentication and all of these best practices. And um, in the end, somebody made a long list of suggestions that if you want to really embrace privacy, you need to do these things. And it was, it was overwhelming just getting yourself off of one of these data aggregator data uh, data marketer things that that that, that traffic and, and and do business in your personal information is very challenging. So there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, For sure. So the uh, there's some other interesting. I've, I've got a, a, a few other that have that have come up. Uh, one was an individual who couldn't make it and asked me to ask this question. Um, basically said, I was potentially going to ask whether you have any thought on how the development process itself might be affected or what changes might be required to facilitate the future of software engineering in this, in this, in this vision that you have of the future uh, mm -hmm. or that this, this sort of uh, distillation of a, of a big collective vision because you cited a number of sources. Yeah. Um, well, I think some of the things that are going to happen is like I, I mentioned those kind of bits of AI that are nibbling at the edges. Um, that, that people don't always think about as, as AI, but they'll get more and more powerful over time. Things like, as I'm typing the query, it's going to say, how, how slow is this going to be in production? Or what did you just impact? Or did you open a security hole? Is this a bad programming practice? Is it compliant with our internal policies? Those kind of things, automatic builds, maybe automatic test fixes, right? There's going to be lots of, there's going to be more developer aids than ever. And we will very quickly just accept them and standardize on them and, and immediately look back at anything else as being totally archaic and useless. Right? So I think we're, we're all gonna push that forward quickly because it's, it's eating our own dog food. So that's probably one of the fastest growing areas. Yeah. 
And in fact, uh, so I had the opportunity to sit in, in uh, Mark Richards' uh, No Fluff Just Stuff workshop a while back. Uh, he's done a number of these. And for those who don't know, by the way, No Fluff Just Stuff does a variety of live instructor-led hands-on half-day workshops. We do about 15 to 20 a month. Um, and uh, if, if you enjoy getting hands-on with an expert, uh, with, a, with a group of folks to, to really – uh, really master a new skill, definitely check that out. They're all listed at nofluffjuststuff.com. And uh, you can you can definitely take these courses a la carte, or uh, you can buy a subscription to share with your entire team for the entire year, and that, that gets you hundreds of these. But um, the reason I bring this up, other than just to mention that that's uh, definitely a great resource for people who want to stay current in this accelerated climate, but uh, Mark Richards gave a talk, a half-day hands-on workshop called patterns of reactive architecture. And what I thought was interesting, he wasn't talking about reactive programming, he was talking about architectures that are self-aware, self-healing, self-correcting, self-tuning. And, um, and this is an area where I think we're gonna see more of this. Uh, you know, there was some work done years ago by folks, like organizations like IBM and others on building what they called autonomic systems that, that are kind of like our body, that the pieces just sort of work. And when something is uh, damaged, it heals, it's self-healing, it's self-repairing, self, uh, it's self uh, repairing, self replicating, et cetera. And he was talking about simple patterns to implement that in our applications. And I really think we're gonna see a lot more of, of AI in that space, right? Totally agree. Yeah, I think um, you mentioned autonomic computing. It kind of, it has an organic flavor to it, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to see even more direct involvement. This sounds weird, but of more organic uh, integration. Like I mentioned, the brain chip. Right? People mm -hmm. are putting actual physical biological neurons on chips now. We're going to see more augmentation the other way. You know, more memory enhancement. So we're, we're going to start blurring the lines. We're going to start saying, well, what's biological system good at? What's a digital system good at? Let's put them together and get the best of both. And I think maybe that organic flavor, that self-healing, self-optimizing, um, you know, self-predicting and adapting even before a change happens, I, I think that's going to be more and more common throughout everything we do. Production, you know, everything from like mentioned kind of microservices and, and architecture deployment, but maybe even things like uh, writing code and adapting to live uh, attacks, you know, security attacks as they happen. So yeah. there's going to be more and more organic flavor of everything going forward. Well, and, and what I've noticed for the last few years is I do, I do a lot of uh, cloud native stuff in, in Azure. And when you use their application insights platform, they, they don't, they don't actually, add, you don't need to configure your monitors anymore because because, you know, there's going to be some amount of noise, some amount of chatter, some amount of, uh, you know, the, you're going to have this like shifting window of timeouts and everything else. And, and so it tells you when things are unusual rather than this metric is crossing some arbitrarily derived like threshold. And, and yeah. so, I mean, there's, there's so many different places. Um, I don't want to dominate the conversation. There's another question in the chat here. Can you share any thoughts or information on the environmental impact. And so for some context, uh, this is from Clark says, I've heard 10% of the world's electronic generation is now used for data centers. Uh, auto driving cars must, must, uh, must be gas because computers consume too much power for an electric car. Uh, I don't know about the uh, veracity of that, that statement, but I'm gonna let you handle this as the expert. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that, I think that's a good example of uh, to come to ArchConf in December. Yeah, <laughs> the virtual yes. conference. Because I'm going to talk uh, a lot about exactly that. I mean, power tech, green tech, you know, with uh, some massive advancements recently in, in solar, wind power, and others. I think we're going to, mm -hmm. we're accelerating. I mean, we're almost at the tipping point at this point. Um, for even BP, I saw a couple of days ago, decided they're spending billions in green tech and are shutting down oil production, right? That's a, that's a biggie. So we're going there quickly. Some of the new uh, advancements in the batteries are using electric cars. I saw another one a couple of days ago. They're going to have a 500 mile EPA rated range, right? So that, that's becoming a thing of the past. You know, we're going to look back in five years and go, oh my God, what, what were we doing with the, uh, the burning things to move around? That doesn't make sense. Right. So oh, yeah. a lot of, lot of change, a lot of fast. So I'm not, 
I'm actually thinking the environmental impact is going to be much better, uh, even in the near future than it was just recently. I, I, I hope so, because, I mean, that's something that, that you know, I mean, there, there, there are people who want to, to debate that, and, I, and, and that's fine, but, you know, what is the risk of being wrong if you think that, that there's nothing to worry about? And that's, that's the way I think about it. Rather than claim to know everything, it's just like, well, w am I willing to live with the risks of being wrong in one direction versus the other? Uh, I'd rather, I'd rather uh, err on the side of caution, personally. By the way, speaking of ArcConf um, or ArchConf, I, I've heard it both ways. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one of No Fluff Just Stuff's flagship events uh, that's taking place in December. Uh, it's going to be a virtual conference this year. But uh, the cool thing is, if you register this year, um, you get the virtual ticket this year and you get a live ticket next year bundled in at no extra cost. Um, so right now uh, you can check it out and see what's what's kind of on the agenda at arcconf, A-R-C-H-C-O-N-F dot com. And right now there's an early bird savings until August 31st. So you've got about a week and a half to take advantage of that. Um, but speaking about the, the developers, uh, so the development process, uh, what else do you see changing for developers in the next five to ten years, and and what can we do to to prepare? What can we do to um, uh, not be left behind, as it were? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I'm a little bit uh, preaching to the choir here because everybody on the call is obviously interested in learning more <laughs> and keeping up uh, to date by attending these kind of webinars. But I think that's a part of it. I think part of it is don't reinvent the wheel. Use what's there, use open source, use commercial, use services, use cloud, don't write stuff from scratch. It's amazing how many people still sit down and yeah. your project and say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna type class string and go from there, right? It does not make sense. You, you can't get to the time to market and keep up with the pace of change we're talking about unless you leverage what exists. So I think part of it is gonna be able to figure out what's good that exists you know, searching libraries, we have a lot of AI, I think, to support that as well. And, and, and uh, kind of watching what we're doing and suggesting, hey, it looks like you're about to implement Quicksort for the 34,000th time. Here's a better yeah. way to just drop that in for you. Or you're about to reinvent the wheel on this other service that exists that maybe you didn't know the guy down the hall was working on or the person across the world or this open source package. Anyway, lots of accelerators. Um, I think... We also need, and I, I kind of ended the talk with this, focus on the user experience. It's so easy mm -hmm. to ignore those pesky end users to say, ah, oh, if it weren't for those, this would be so easy. Um, they make us succeed. They give us the money. Think about making their life easier. Take one bit of friction out of their day when they use your stuff, whether that's um, it's easier to upgrade, it's easier to install, it's easier to pay, it's easier to cancel. Anything that you can do to remove a little bit of friction will put you one step closer to where you need to be because other people are going to make it easier if you don't and you'll regret it. Uh, no, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, that seems to be the, the defining characteristic of um, that friction is going away and, and that's, you know, anybody can kind of spin up anything astonishingly fast now to, to your point uh, in Austin, Texas, they there was a, a a breakdown between Uber, Lyft, and the city of Austin, and there was just a disagreement over how they were going to vet drivers. And Austin and and or uh, Uber and Lyft basically said, okay, well we're going to take our ball and go home. And within literally 72 hours, a number of Uber clones popped up out of nowhere. Um, you know what took years of development, honestly, on on Uber's part was just stitch together this service, that service, the other th service, throw it on the cloud, and you're ready to go. Um, and it's, it's, it, it, it's astonishing what we can do. And again, that, that comes back to uh, look at things, I guess, would, would it be fair to say that uh, it's imperative that we keep looking forward and not backwards in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've barred the standing on the shoulders of giants, but now it's like we <laughs> can't work. We're floating above the giants. I mean, there's so much capacity in every sense of the world out there, the word out there that we can all use immediately. And most of it, you can get off the ground literally for nothing, free. There's free practically every service you can imagine to get 
started. So like you said, the Uber Club makes a lot of sense. You know, I think another trend I haven't really mentioned yet, I'll talk about this more in a longer version of the talk, is low code, no code. And I know developers aren't uh, excited about hearing that, but the concept, if you've been around for a while and you remember the power builder days, right? Mm -hmm. And the IBM visual ages of the world. Yeah, they, they were slow and heavy and they sucked, but fast forward 25 years, sprinkle in some AI, some cloud services. Those tools now are starting to become real. I, I, uh, Amazon announced one recently called Honeycode. It's point and click. I can get a native app in the app store, fully managed, fully backed up, fully scaled, I can be a business person who's zilch about computers. I can click my way to that an hour, right? Can they build the next Uber clone? Uh, maybe not, but can they replace the next spreadsheet they're about to do and email around? Yeah. And so I think we're going to see a lot of those, those annoying, tedious jobs that people had, developers had to do in the past, like, oh, it's yet another CRUD app. That's going to be a point and click exercise pretty soon, powered by AI. And then the developer gets to focus on the meteor stuff. So yeah. I think that's well, another trend that's going to affect development quite a bit. And, you know, I, I think this is, well, I can certainly speaking for myself, it's, it's sort of a hard thing to grasp that, uh, that what we do is going to be disrupted. But really, if you think about it, this has happened many times in our industry. Uh, you know, I remember when we had a dedicated developer, a dedicated team of developers whose job it was to maintain the data access layer, the DAO. And now we have tools that do that for us. Uh, I, as a DBA, I was a DBA for a while, and it used to be we had a whole team of people whose job it was to tune the database. And um, the database has tuned themselves now. And, and, it, and it's, it's so good. I have a friend of mine who's still a, a, a practicing DBA, and he just says, yeah, I just, I just, I, I've gotten tired of like uh, rubber stamp approving these because they're all good things to do. And so I just said, just go and do it. Uh, and has given the uh, the platform full autonomy to do that. So we're definitely seeing more and more of that. Uh, things that, that that we're just working at, at higher and higher levels of abstraction, which segues nicely to a question from Farsi, saying, "What about interview questions? Because uh, for better or for worse, in our industry, interview questions are are focused at at, at a at a level of abstraction lower than probably 98% of developers actually work." Um, I've been, a, I've been a practicing software engineer professionally for over two decades, and I've, I mean, I've never had to write a sorting algorithm or, or a lot of these low-level things because I don't, I don't need to. That's, it's it's, it's, it, it's bat free and batteries included in every language and framework that I work with. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good, I think you kind of hit it on that. You know, we continue to work at higher levels of abstraction. It used to be the assembler developers you know, or like the higher level language because the guy's just writing raw machine code. We're like, oh, you panting, what do you need that for? You know, <laughs> just, yeah. it's just gone from there over time. I mean, I, you know, a guy I went to college with, a uh, uh, whole hand rolled C, that's all he wanted to use. But he would occasionally let a compiler help him if he had to deal with file access because that was a pain, right? And now we're talking about, uh, I think an interview question I might ask is um, if I needed, if I needed um, an AI, to write, to write an automatic recommender engine for what we're doing, what would be the Google search term I'd start with? Yeah, that's honestly, that's what I'm interested in. I don't, I don't want to know like what you've wrote, memorized. I want to know how you solve problems, and that, and and we we need to normalize the fact that that is that is a legitimate path to solving problems. Um, I mean, that's it. it anyway, um, I I want to mention we're we're about out of time. I want to mention two things. Uh, in addition to our conf, uh, folks definitely do check out, uh, you know, all, everything is virtual this year for No Fluff Just Stuff. And uh, if you're familiar with the brand, what we do, we bring the very best presenters in the world, uh, usually locally to a number of a, a number of cities around the country. But uh, this year, everything is virtual, which kind of makes some things easier, some things more difficult. But uh, we do have a handful of events coming up September 10th and 11th. And October 1st and 2nd, um, uh, we've got those taking place. And these are our tour. So these are a little more broadly focused, unlike our comp, which is 
which is focused entirely on the spectrum of skills critical to being a software architect. Uh, the no fluff, just stuff virtual tour shop stops have a little bit more of a breadth. So you can dip into some soft skills or software architecture or, or ML or, or some of these other emerging technologies like Rust, WebAssembly, GraalVM, LLVM, um, and, and some really cool things like that, and just general good software development uh, stuff, frameworks, and, and all the rest. So, uh, so we've got a couple coming up. Those are also available at nofluffjuststuff.com, and we have an early bird ending for those as well uh, at the end of August. So, so check that out as well. But uh, we're at the top of the hour, and that's about it from me. So, uh, Rod, I want to leave you with the last word. Oh, the last word. Okay. The, uh, the, the future is not yet written. There's no fate but what we make for ourselves. Right? Go out there and create good stuff. Stay on top of things. I love it. All right. Uh, Rod, thank you for your time. And folks out there listening or watching the recording, uh, thank you. If you're wondering about the recording, by the way, it will be available soon. Uh, it might be about a 24-hour uh, delay. We'll see. Uh, but that's going to be on nofluffjuststuff.com. So thank you. And this is really exciting stuff. Uh, thank you. Thank you, folks out there. And thank you, Rod. Yeah, you're welcome. Bye, everybody. Bye.